Um, that is a very primitive, and of course we could do that, um, but as you saw, my markers are kind of, kind of widely spaced around the genome. There are tens of thousands of genes, and I would really like to get a more precise sense of where that QTL is located. And the way that we do that is a technique called interval mapping. Interval mapping is a way of interpolating between the markers. So we know the markers are just these anonymous locations in the DNA. The QTL, in all likelihood, is somewhere between a pair of markers. So we want to look in between the markers. And there are some other complications. Uh, often the marker data are missing. Sometimes there are errors in the marker data. There can be all kinds of issues. The, the markers can be widely spaced. And we want to use a, 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 a solid statistical technique, in fact, an optimal statistical technique called the maximum likelihood method. Maximum likelihood, well, it's a bit complicated, but what it really boils down to is, um, is regression with a twist. And I'm not going to get into it in great detail, but this is the only slide that I'm going to talk about the genotype part of the model the relationship between the QTL locus and the marker locus. And here's a cartoon showing uh, a single chromosome of a single animal. At this marker, the genotype is B. This marker, the genotype is missing. And at this marker, the genotype again is B. And suppose that the QTL is right there at the little triangle. It's in between. If you had to guess what the genotype of that marker was, uh, pardon me, if you had to guess what the genotype of that QTL was, a good guess would be B. Because for it to be A, there would have had to be two recombinations, and chances are this is a pretty small interval, and that's an unlikely scenario. So I would guess that it's a B. In fact, I can make that guess precise by doing the following calculations which are shown in this table. I can look at the marker to the left, M1. I can look at the marker to the right, M2. I can figure out which genotypes they have, and depending on what their genotypes are, and where I think the QTL is relative to the left marker and relative to the right marker, I can actually calculate the probabilities of the QTL genotypes. These, in our QTL jargon, are called genoprobs. And you will repeatedly do something called calc genoprob. And you may never know what it does, because you may forget this slide, but if you ever wonder, it does something like this. It's actually calculating the probability at this little triangle that the QTL is a B or an AB. There are many different techniques for interval mapping. I think the classical one is this EM algorithm that was described in 1989 in a very famous paper by Lander and Botstein. Um, there's a regression approximation by Haley and Knott that was presented in 1992. And there is this multiple imputation method which has some, I would say, specialized uh, uses. EM is the gold standard. It works all the time. It's a little slow. The regression approximation works really fast. And in fact, the weakness is when the markers are sparse or incomplete. And because modern technology gives us really dense and really complete markers, I almost always use haley knott method now. So when you're doing interval mapping genome scans, I recommend the HK method. Although if you have doubts, you might fall back to the EM method and the imp method, well, uh, like I said, it has a special uh, role, but not generally something that we're going to use. Um, so having calculated my interval mapping across the entire genome, I compute a statistic, and this is unfortunate that I chose proportion of variance explained on the y-axis. The typical statistic that we use is something called a LOD score. A LOD score, it's not important in great detail what it means. It's kind of like a t-test. It's a likelihood ratio test related to the maximum likelihood method. The point is that when a location in the genome is more strongly associated with a trait, the LOD score is high. When a location is weakly associated with a trait, the LOD score is low. 
So a high LOD score means a strong association. And if I were to go through the whole genome from chromosome 1 to chromosome 20 to uh, 19 to 20, which is what we sometimes call X because it's convenient, uh, we can calculate the LOD score at every location in the genome and we get this LOD score profile. On chromosome 1, we see it's got two little bumps. That's interesting. It's a complicated story that we may talk about later. But look at here on chromosome 4, there's this great big high peak. The LOD score on chromosome 4 is really high, and if I had to guess where the gene for blood pressure is, remember I told you there's no gene for blood pressure. There are lots of genes that affect blood pressure, but if I had to guess where the biggest effect in the genome was, I'm putting my money on chromosome 4. Something on chromosome 4 that affects blood pressure. So, how do I know that and how do I say that with such confidence? You probably didn't even notice, but subconsciously, that there are some horizontal lines across the picture. And it's a very important decision-making procedure to know when the LOD score is high enough that you should be interested in it. And the trick is where to draw the horizontal lines. I want you to notice something about the way I interpreted the LOD score profile. I went right to the peak. I looked at the whole thing across the whole genome, but what I really care about is the highest point in the genome. That's a bit of a subtlety, but what it means is I've effectively chosen the highest test statistic from hundreds of test statistics that I computed across the whole genome. Uh, it's sometimes called a multiple testing problem, and it's a subtle one that we have to solve somehow. There's actually a simple solution to it that you can uh, carry out by doing something called a permutation analysis. In a permutation analysis, you compute your LOD score across the whole genome. In the jargon we use a lot, we call this a genome scan. But the genome scan only gives us the curve. It doesn't tell us how high it would be. And what I'd like to do next is I'm going to take the phenotype data and I'm going to drop it on the floor, scramble the pieces around, and sweep it back up and stick it on the spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And what I've done is I've messed up my data. And with my permuted data, there should be no relationship between the phenotype and the genotype. I really scrambled the data and I broke that relationship. So my permuted data gives me a null. It gives me a way to say, what would that LOD score look like if there was nothing genetic happening. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to run my genome scan on that null data and what I'm going to do is just what I did before. I'm not going to record the whole curve. I'm just going to note how big the highest point is. So I'm going to record the maximum LOD score. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do that a lot. And after I've done that a lot, I get a sense of how big that maximum LOD score should be if there's nothing happening in my data. Here's a cartoon. Um, Here's my genotype data, and here's my phenotype data. I'm going to take that phenotype data and scramble it, and I'm going to compute all the LOD scores, but I'm only going to pick the maximum one, and then I'm going to record those maximum LOD scores until I get a, a thousand or ten thousand of them, until I get a whole distribution of them, and then I'm going to look at the 95th percentile of the maximum LOD score. In this case, uh, the way I drew it, it's about 3.2 and I'm going to draw my horizontal line at 3.2. Now this is not a yes, it's not a black and white decision. There's a lot of gray here. It's a guideline. It's not a definitive answer. The QTL could be just above or just below the line and the distinction is meaningless. But if it's way above or way below the line, it's a QTL or it's not a QTL. And we just need a guideline to help us decide when something's interesting and that's the way we draw the horizontal lines. Um, there's another interesting thing that we get from the interval mapping LOD curves. What I've shown you here is I've zoomed in on a single chromosome and I'm showing you the detail of the LOD curve. And this could be the chromosome 4 LOD curve just spread out across the page so it looks a little more squat. But if I had to guess where the QTL was in the genome, I'd go to the peak. I'd go right to the top and I'd say, well, it's right there. It's about 30 centimorgans. But 
I know there's a lot of uncertainty in this location of the QTL. I don't really know that it's exactly there. It's somewhere around there, but not exactly there. And without getting into great detail, this is a this was one of the, the most horrendous statistical problems I've ever seen solved to come up with the simplest rule. The rule says take the highest point on the log curve and drop down 1.5 units. It's very important that you do this on the scale of a LOD, but if you drop down 1.5 units and you draw a horizontal line and where it intersects the curve, you draw an interval. This is called my 1.5 LOD support interval. This is, the, this is the lamp. This is where the lamp shines the light. This is where we look for the gene. It's in here somewhere, okay? It's probably in the middle. It might be near the edges. And every once in a while, it's gonna be outside that interval. But you hope not. You have to concentrate your uh, interest somewhere, and that's the most likely place to find the gene is in the LOD support interval. Uh, honestly, in practice, I often go to two LODs, and sometimes I just look at the whole chromosome because it's often not entirely clear where you should be looking. But this is the first rule of locating where in the genome the QTL gene might be. And I'll tell you that in an interval this big, if you can think about this for a minute, there are, there are 20 chromosomes. They, there are about 20,000 genes in the genome, so if you picked a random chromosome, it might have about 1,000 genes. This is about 20% of the genome, so there are 200 genes in there. And I'll tell you what, you tend to get unlucky, and the QTLs tend to be in the most gene-dense parts of the genome, so there might actually be 500 genes in there. And the task of sifting through those genes and identifying which one are ones, because it could be multiple genes, which of those genes is affecting blood pressure is, well, that's the next step. Uh, I'd also like to uh, just show you, uh, going back to the blood pressure example, that just like in the in the marker regression, we could see the difference between the AB and the BB mean blood pressures. We could get an estimate of the blood pressure, but it was slightly biased by that one minus two R term. The interval mapping method gives us an unbiased estimate of the effect of the blood pressure, and this is this example is actually the blood pressure data itself. I'm going to look at chromosome four. And I'm going to notice that I have, for the animals on chromosome 4 with the heterozygous genotype, their mean blood pressure is just a little over 98. I have, I have error bars around that, so I have a mean plus and minus one standard error. And you can see that the error bars are tiny compared to the difference between the two genotypes. That's another signal that something is statistically significant going on here. So the, the chromosome 4 has an effect of shifting the blood pressure. Uh, the B allele, or, or should, I guess I should say the A allele, shifts the blood pressure down by over 5 millimeters of mercury. So it's a pretty big effect. I can pop over here to chromosome 1 and I see a similar picture. Here the A allele shifts the blood pressure down, maybe only 4 millimeters of mercury, so it's not quite as big an effect. Notice that the scales are all the same, by the way, 98 to 106. Um, a couple of places in the genome that I didn't mention but turn out to be very important are chromosome 6 and 15. And something interesting about chromosome 6 is that it goes the wrong way. In this case, the A allele drives the blood pressure up. Even though the A animals have lower blood pressure when they're inbred, when they contribute their chromosome 6 to the offspring, that drives the blood pressure up. That's interesting. And chromosome 15 is turned back around the right way. You notice that chromosome 6 and 15 are much smaller effects. They didn't really stand out on the LOD curve, but when we go to the next steps of looking at multiple QTLs simultaneously, what we're going to find out is that chromosomes 6 and 15 have something going on called an epistatic interaction. Their true nature is not revealed by looking at them one at a time. We really have to look at them simultaneously to see how they work together. That, however, is an advanced topic in QTL analysis.
And that's it for today. I really uh, owe a great debt uh, to Carl Broman, my uh, longtime colleague and, and friend who developed the RQTL package and uh, shared a lot of uh, QTL ideas back and forth with me over the years. Uh, he's a great guy. Maybe you'll get to meet him someday. Chen Li worked in my lab for many years, uh, helped me work through some of these examples. The, uh, the, the mouse experiments that I showed in, in this slide show were done by Beverly Pagan, and the, uh, the mouse experiments that I cut out because my slide show was way too long were done by Eva Rede, and I'll, I'll come back to those experiments. Actually, she did the rat crosses. You, you probably didn't notice that I interleaved a bit of mouse and rat together in, throughout the talk, but um, uh, the rat cross, very interesting. Uh, the mouse cross is what I showed you today. Um, I thank you for listening.